Thank you for tuning in to the Voice of the Victim podcast. We discuss a lot of sad and potentially triggering things on this show. We try to be as sensitive and cautious as possible, but if you are sensitive to things involving abuse and may be triggered, please think twice before listening to our show. Hey guys, welcome to the Voice of the Victim podcast. My name is Ryan. And I'm Rosie. And we are a day late. Um, My work schedule's been pretty crazy. You might have seen that on our Instagram. I just wanted to thank a few people that commented on our Instagram and Facebook posts with nice words. Lindsay, Heather, Caitlin, Cheyenne, and Carissa. It was very kind words and supportive and really meant a lot. Mm Mm-hmm. And also, Spotify did their year-end list thing, and it was really cool. Some people shared on Instagram, Maria and Mayba shared their lists, and we were uh, the most listened to podcast, so (laughs) it was pretty awesome. That confused me until you explained it to me, what I was looking at. It makes me wish I used Spotify for podcasts, because then... Well, I do. Never mind. Oh. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I still use Apple Podcasts, but the app's been acting really weird lately. I think they're bogging it down with too much crap. But anyway, I also want to thank Kristen for the nice emails. It's been really cool. We've gotten a lot of nice feedback this week, and we really appreciate it. And of course, we want to thank all of our patrons for their nice support. And if you are a recent patron, be sure to check your Patreon messages, because uh, we just want to make sure it's okay to give you a shout out on the show. So, with all that said, you ready to jump into the story for the week? Yeah. Well, this week's story begins back in the Niigata Prefecture of Japan, where Fusako Sano's story in episode 79 took place. And if you remember back to that, we mentioned that when she went missing, at one point the Japanese authorities suspected some sketchy diplomatic practices that may have been involved. So, who are we talking about tonight, Rosie? We are telling the story of Megumi Yakoda. And thankfully, we have a much more detailed resource this week than usual. We found it on the Wayback Machine Internet Archive, and it was a document from ReachDC.net. Because it's so detailed, we're able to tell a much more colorful story, so it should be pretty interesting. So now let's get to know who Megumi Yakoda was. We're going to talk first about her parents, Shigeru and Saki. On October 5th, 1964, Shigeru Yokota was at work in Nagoya, Japan. And he worked for a bank. That morning, he got a call from his wife, Saki, telling him that she was having labor pains. So he ran out of work and caught a taxi and got home as fast as he could. He took her to the Siri Hospital. They took Saki back to check in, and he went back to work to tell them that he needed the day off and to grab his camera. He rushed back to the hospital. He was worried he was going to miss the birth, but labor ended up being more difficult than they expected, and it lasted for quite a while. Finally, that evening, they welcomed their new little girl, Megumi Yokoda. Yeah, and Saki and Shigeru remember this day really fondly, because it was the day they started their family, which was something that meant more to them than anything else. Shigeru was very excited to welcome his little girl and took pictures by her side as the nurses washed and measured her. And they actually chose the name Megumi. This is interesting because it would be easily written in hiragana, which is Japanese phonetic writing style. So basically sounding things out. So I thought that was pretty interesting. She eventually had two little twin brothers. Their names were Takuya and Testuya. But Megumi was daddy's girl. When the family would go to the movie theater, uh, the mom, Saki, actually took the two younger twin brothers to like an animated movie or something. But Megumi wanted to stick with her dad and saw whatever movie he wanted to see. Aww. I bet that kept his choices very mild. (laughs) (laughs) When she told her father she wanted to go see the all-female musical theater group called Takarazuka, 
he took her to see that as well. They had a very tight bond. Megumi was known to be bright and energetic and very curious. When she'd come home from school, the somewhat quiet house would become lively and exciting. She always had a smile to brighten the mood, and she would walk around the house singing. Yeah, her little brothers referred to her as their sunflower. Your favorite flower, Rosie. That's super cute. I love that. I also love that uh, Post Malone song. It's pretty cool. She was also known to be very kind. One time there was a fellow student living in her neighborhood who was afraid to go to the first day of school, but Megumi offered support to the other child, taking them to school with her. The family enjoyed travel, and Shiguru loved taking pictures of his family during the trip. So there are a lot of pictures you can find of this family, and you can tell they were a very loving and close-knit family. Megumi read a lot of books and was very smart for her age. She was easily able to have conversations with people much older than her. And she was even recognized by the school library for borrowing more books than any other student one of the years. (laughs) Wow, that's cool. She also loved to draw from a young age, and she would draw characters from the Rose of the Versailles. Which was a Japanese manga series. Glad you said that, otherwise I would not have figured that out. (laughs) Same. As she was growing up, the family lived in Hiroshima, and then to Niigata, as Shiguru needed a transfer for work. The day Megumi started junior high, she got measles, and her father actually stood in for her during her orientation ceremony and took notes for her so she wouldn't miss anything. That's really sweet. That is. Also, before we go any further, I just want to again say um, there are a lot of names and cities and everything in this that we're not familiar with on a daily basis, so... We're going to try our best to pronounce everything correctly. I looked up all the words I could find for proper pronunciation, but a lot of the names don't have that. So we're going to do our best based on what we know of the Japanese language, and which is very little. But <laughs> thank you for understanding that we, we have um, best intentions, but we might get some stuff wrong. Ditto. <laughs> On Shigeru's 45th birthday, Megumi gave him a pocket comb and said, Dad, care more about your appearance. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, so she was kind of spunky. She was lively. She she made a very big impact on the family. It's really sweet to see. Um, So that was his 45th birthday. But the next day was November 15th, 1977. And something unexpected happened that day. Megumi's mother, Saki, began to worry that evening because her daughter was taking longer than expected to return home from badminton practice. It was 7 p.m., and she typically came home around 6. She only had a 10-minute walk from the school, but that time of year, it was dark at the time she walked home. The street she walked home on was near the coast, between an old abandoned hotel that had burned down and an open lot where a university campus used to sit. They lived in a single-family home which Shiguru's work provided for them, and near their home was a forest and the Japan Sea. Megumi had never been late like this before, so Saki felt really uneasy about the whole situation. She decided to go to the school and look for Megumi. She walked as fast as she could, hoping to come across her daughter, but only passed one stranger along the way. She got to the school and saw the lights were still on. She was relieved when she heard women's voices as she approached the gym, hoping that practice was just running late. She decided to walk into the gym anyways just to check on her daughter. But when she looked inside, she froze in shock. It wasn't students playing badminton. It was a group of adults using the gym to play volleyball. And it was at this moment, Saki realized something was really wrong. I can only imagine that her heart sank and she started to panic. She began walking towards home and came across a guard. She asked him if the badminton students had left, and he told her that they had left at 6 o'clock. So, with every bit of information, things are just getting worse. Saki was terrified after hearing this and ran home as fast as she could, hoping to find her daughter there. 
and many thoughts were running through her head, hoping that she was just at a friend's house or something. She rushed into the home and was sad to see that Megumi's shoes were not sitting by the door. The twin boys ran to meet her at the door, and she frantically asked them if if their sister had returned yet. But she hadn't. Saki started calling the parents of Megumi's friends and a teacher from the badminton club. None of them knew where she was, and they were surprised to know that she hadn't returned. Desperate to find her daughter, Saki brought the twins and walked around outside with a flashlight. She even went into the abandoned hotel, where she would typically be too afraid to go. They all called out for her as loud as they could, but no one called back. They searched along the shore and even in the forest, asking anyone she saw along the way if they knew anything. Some of the people she stopped were irritated by her because she shined the flashlight into their cars. Which is understandable. I would hate that. But once you find out what's going on, you can obviously get why she's so frantic. The young boys cried as their mother searched, afraid of the loud rumbling ocean sounds. They returned home feeling defeated. Then, Megumi's teacher came over to try to help. As soon as they arrived, the phone rang. It was Megumi's father, Shiguru. He was calling to tell his wife that he'd be home late because he was engrossed in a Mahjong game during a party the bank was having for a new employee. Mahjong always seems to get in the way, but Saki alerted him that his Mahjong game was the least of his concerns. He typically walked home from work, but this day, he caught a taxi to get home as fast as he could. Three of his friends from work also came to support the family. Shiguru checked all the places that his wife had already checked again. The teacher had an idea about where she could be. He theorized that she may have accidentally locked herself in a bathroom or classroom at the school after going back in to grab something that she forgot. So he went and searched the school. Again, she was nowhere to be found. Just before 10 p.m., after realizing they had nowhere else to look and that it was likely more serious than they had originally thought, they called the police. Seventeen police officers from Niigata came to the Yokota home and launched a missing persons investigation. Speaking to Megumi's friend from the badminton club, they were able to paint a picture of what happened. Megumi left the school with two friends around 6.25 p.m. They walked towards Megumi's home on a street that led toward the seashore. One of her friends turned right at a crossroad, and the other turned left at the next crossroad. So by 6.35 p.m., Megumi was by herself, um, finishing the walk home alone in the dark. And that was the stretch between the abandoned hotel and the opening where the campus had been. So that's where the police deployed their search dogs. After getting Megumi's scent from a set of her pajamas, they started at the school and traced her scent all the way toward her home. But just as they arrived at the last street corner before her home, they lost it. It was less than 100 yards away from her front door. So it was literally like she'd vanished into thin air. It was obvious that she had been carried either by a vehicle or another person away from this spot. Unfortunately, there was a storm rolling in, and they had to delay the search. But around 5 a.m., they resumed the search again. A team of officers specializing in kidnapping stayed at the Yokota home. They also attached a call tracer to the telephone at the home and at Shiguru's workplace. They're suspicious that this would be a ransom situation, so they wanted to be prepared in case a kidnapper called to demand money or something like that. They also stationed undercover police cars around the home to keep an eye on the property, and Megumi's parents napped by the telephone, hoping to get a call. Shiguru took the next week off of work, and they were so focused on finding her that they didn't even change their clothes and only slept in short bursts when they couldn't keep their eyes open any longer. That day, the 16th of November, they started a large-scale search with several police troops from all over the Niigata Prefecture. Again, we mentioned this in Fusako Sano's episode, but a prefecture's like a state. Uh, Niigata has over 2.2 million people in it, so this isn't a small police force. 
The troops lined up side by side and swept several areas, including the shore and the woods near the house, and they carried metal sticks to poke the ground as they searched. Mm. They also conducted interviews with members of every home in the neighborhood. One of the people they interviewed mentioned that they had seen a UFO in the area, but I don't think anyone gave that idea much consideration. I don't think I would have given it much consideration either. I know, but some people would. Um, but seriously, all of this had a really profound impact on the two young boys, Takuya and Testuya. They saw how desperate and distraught their parents were, and it was a really stressful situation for them because mm -hmm. they're kids. They need their parents' full attention, but they're... I mean, you know how this is, Rosie. When mm -hmm. your parents are distracted by some huge tragedy in their life, mm -hmm. it's, it, it's tough on, on the, the other kid. kids. Mm -hmm. you know? Well, there were a number of theories about what had happened. Some thought that she may have gotten jumped by some delinquent kids from the neighborhood. And if you listen to episode 100 of True Crime Island, you'll know that this isn't a stretch. And others thought that she could have been involved in a car accident, or taken by a driver, or just kidnapped. Or even harder to imagine, that she may have run away. A week passed with no phone calls, so the police decided to make the case public, hoping someone would have some answers for them. So, at the same time, a week after she went missing, Shigeru returned to work. Um, the bank was making everyone else work late night hours, but they actually made an exception for Shigeru because of Good. the circumstances he was in. They posted her photo on the front page of the Niigata Nippo newspaper. The national newspaper, oh geez, Minichi newspaper also ran a small article. I think that was right. Thank you. But even after reaching out um, through the media, they were unable to find any useful information. And this actually became the largest missing persons investigation in the history of the Niigata Prefectural Police wow. at the time. It's nice to see that there's so much going on to try to find her, though. I like, know. Everyone seems super involved. They searched along the coast by boat and helicopter, all the way up to the neighboring prefecture of Yamagata. And they even had divers searching underwater all the way up the coast. Shigeru himself would walk along the shore every morning before work, searching the waters, bracing himself for the worst. I can't imagine those walks. Ugh. Every night before bed, Saki and Shigeru talked about Megumi and cried. Ugh. It's, I can't imagine this. how difficult this would be. Like, we're not even parents, but if we were and we had... Because it's hard work raising a kid, and you, you know, you, the bond you form with a child is so strong. Mm -hmm. For one of them to suddenly be gone and have no idea, no closure. No closure at all. No idea what's going on. It's just no way to feel peace ever, you know. But one of the twins, Takuya, said that it felt like he was living in a situation he'd only seen on TV and thought could never happen in his own life, which everyone who goes through these situations probably feels, mm -hmm. you know. The family, uh, which had once been very happy and close-knit, was starting to fall apart. The family dinners lost their light and fun atmosphere and became quiet and somber. And Shigeru made a statement about the state of the family during the time. Rosie, will you read that? Mm -hmm. It says, Some people say that when there is trouble in the home, the family strengthens its ties. But I disagree. Actually, trouble rather has a strong force to make the family fall down. Because the reason for her disappearance was unknown, we could not resolve our feelings. If we hoped that our daughter was alive, then the reason had to be that she had run away. But this contradicted those happy years with Megumi. At worst, we might have reached the point where we had to divorce each other. In our household, we had twin bro brothers, and we had to bring them up. My wife could not cry all the time. It propped up our family. So that's an interesting perspective, because they had no closure at all. It just had to be so frustrating. 
Saki and Shiguru actually stopped leaving the house together because they always wanted someone home by the phones in case there was a call with information. And there's actually a disagreement between Saki and Shigeru about which picture they would use to represent their daughter on her missing posters. Shigeru wanted to use a photo that was taken in front of the school gate in her uniform because it was the same clothes that she was wearing when she went missing. But she had a somber look on her face because she was recovering from being sick. Saki wanted to use a picture that more accurately represented her bright and lively personality. Ultimately, they decided on the school uniform picture, um, which is the most common picture you'll find if you Google Megumi Yakota, but because that's what she was wearing, and to be honest, if she was found, I don't think she'd be in her bright and lively personality. Right. It's so sad to see these small things that just really, really do a number on the family when these situations happen. I know. Like this picture, I'm sure this was a huge huge disagreement yeah that took days to figure out because every little thing's magnified when you're Mm -hmm. under this kind of stress a lot of time passed with no new information about megumi and police actually started questioning saki and shiguru because they were never able to find the body they searched the home for any evidence that they could find Uh, yikes i'm sure this devastated the parents well yeah it would i mean i'm I'm surprised they didn't look into the family sooner because that's typically where the investigation always starts. True. But, you know, they were so distraught and desperate to find her. It was really difficult to have suspicion fall on them, but it was also pretty obvious that they didn't know what happened. Mm -hmm. They were at a loss for what could have happened and began to consider the possibility that she ran away. This led to Saki questioning her parenting, wondering if she was a bad mother. Or if she raised her daughter the wrong way and hadn't noticed that that her daughter was depressed. And these thoughts were just eating away at her. Shiguru believed there was no way his daughter had ran away. Because the day she went missing, she had just returned a book to the library and checked out a new one. She had also left her watch and her checkbook at home. So she had no money with her. Also, the day she disappeared was the day she would have gotten her allowance, which was the 15th of every month, Shigeru's payday. So it just didn't make any sense that she would run away right before getting her allowance. But then again, the implications behind denying her running away were even scarier. It meant there was either foul play or she'd succumb to a horrible accident. Saki was so depressed that Shiguru began to worry that she might even take her own life. Her life became either crying or looking for her daughter. She couldn't help but go on her bike looking in strange places like behind stairs and a train station for her daughter. She would take the twins with her, who would get exhausted following her. But she kept persisting, telling them, just a little more. This poor mother did her best to keep caring for her two sons, even though she was so torn apart. They stopped taking family trips. They replaced the light on their gate with a brighter one so it wasn't as dark at night, in case Megumi would come home. Saki was so desperate to find her daughter that she remembered there was a movie Megumi had seen that past summer and really enjoyed. She decided to watch the movie to look for any clues about what her motivation could be to leave if she had run away. She would walk through bookstores, flipping through magazines, looking for her daughter's drawings, just in case she had been there. Yeah, we mentioned she would typically draw pictures of, like, the Rose of Versailles. Was Mm. that what it was called? Mm Mm-hmm. So, she was looking for any pictures similar to that. Um, Saki and Shigeru appeared on five different TV shows, asking for calls with any clues about their daughter. Most people who appeared on these shows would get calls, but no calls came in for them at all. Wow. So that would be a huge bummer. Saki and Shiguru began to see people that looked like Megumi everywhere. Saki thought she saw her daughter in a photo of a crowd of people from a newspaper. She reached out to the paper, and they sent her in a large copy of the photo. But it wasn't her. Yeah. Another time... When Shigeru was watching a girl on TV singing, he started to tear up because she looked like his daughter. Aww. 
And the same thing happened with a girl he saw on the street. Um, about two months after her disappearance, something happened that gave the family a little hope. A phone call came in to the Yokota home. Saki answered the phone, and the man on the other line said, I'm holding Megumi-san here with me, and he demanded a ransom. So this was obviously terrifying for Saki to get this phone call. She remembers her legs physically trembling with fear during that call, but at the same time, she felt a little bit hopeful that she'd finally get her daughter back. Thankfully, the police had rigged that call tracker up to the phone. Police rushed over to their house and traced the call. They quickly identified the caller and were able to arrest him. They began questioning him, hoping that this would finally lead to the discovery of Megumi's whereabouts. But again, the results were disappointing. It turned out to be a prank call by a high school student who had nothing to do with her disappearance. He just formulated the story based on the newspaper articles. What so, a jerk. This was a huge letdown of the family. Like, who does this kind of crap? So, with a lot of time passing, the family began to lose hope again. Ten years passed with no new information. And Shigeru's work ended up transferring him to a branch in the Gunma prefecture of Japan. So at this point, they had pretty much lost hope of seeing their daughter again. Shigeru and Saki were trying to move on and enjoy their lives as best as they could. They went together to a soba noodle restaurant for a date night. While they were there, they found a magazine with a picture of a woman that looked just like their daughter. She was a contestant in a local beauty contest called Bowling Lady, which was hosted by local bowling alleys. And the contestants were going to play a bowling tournament at the Shinagawa Prince Hotel in Tokyo. So Saki decided to go to the tournament in hopes that it was her daughter in the magazine. Hmm. Saki got there 30 minutes before it started and snagged a seat in the second row so she had a clear view of the, contest of the contestants. Eventually, the woman came out. She looked just like an older version of her daughter, but she realized early on that it wasn't her. On another occasion, Saki saw a painting of a woman who also looked just like Megumi. She visited the gallery to find out who the model was. And they were actually able to meet with the painter and explain their situation and that they thought their daughter had possibly gotten amnesia and was working as a model now. You know, they were desperate, trying to find any way to find their daughter. But the model was actually a close acquaintance of the painter, and they were able to prove her identity, and it was not Megumi. So, to this point, they have gone through so much disappointment. In 1990, the family heard about another girl who had disappeared from Nigata in an almost identical fashion to Megumi. And you may know who we're talking about. We told her story in episode 79, Usako Sano. They had both disappeared on their way home from school, and they wondered if it may have been the same person fetching a new girl 13 years later. But they still had no idea who had taken Fusako Sano at this time. So they began to lose hope, and the effort slowed down. Eventually, the family moved again from Gunma to Tokyo. 20 years passed. And despite the lack of information, the family hadn't given up the hope of finding their daughter. On January 21st, 1997, Shiguru and Saki Yagota were going about their business. They had moved into a condo in the Kawasaki City, which is a suburb of Tokyo. Saki was over in Chiba for a monthly Christian prayer meeting. And Chiba is just across the bay from Tokyo. This was actually the day she announced to her prayer group that her son, Takuya, was getting married. The group congratulated her on the happy news, which was such a contrast from what the family typically had. Saki had been having a really rough time coping after her daughter disappeared. It was common for her to break down crying in her home during the day when her husband and sons led left for work. She would cry while doing pretty much anything that would remind her of her daughter. Yeah. And she had turned to religion after her daughter disappeared to help her cope because she was having such a hard time. 
This same day, Shiguru was sitting in the condo watching TV when the phone rang. It was the Alumni Association of the Bank of Japan, from which he had just retired five years earlier. They told him that Atus- At Atsushi sushi. <laughs> Hashimoto of the Japanese Communist Party was trying to get a hold of Shigeru, but they were not authorized to give out personal information. So instead, they asked Shigeru to call Hashimoto's secretary, Tatsukichi. <laughs> Tatsukichi Hayamoto. Thank you. No problem. I didn't expect you to get that one. <laughs> so, again, we don't want the names to get confusing. Hayamoto is Hashimoto's secretary. But don't feel bad if you're confused. Shigeru was also confused by this request. But he dialed the number right away to figure out what was going on. The secretary, Hayamoto, picked up and informed Shigeru that he had been informed that his daughter was alive in North Korea. Obviously, Shigeru was shocked to hear this. It had been 20 years with no new information, and now suddenly he's getting this call. Wow. He went on to say how he'd been investigating a few other cases that seemed to be perpetrated by North Korean abductors, and he just recently heard about Megumi's story and was curious about the circumstances. He had a strong feeling her case was connected as well. They asked him to come to the members' building of the House of the Counselors to tell his daughter's story, and he left his home right away. So this sparked a new wave of hope in him. And all he could think on the way there was that his daughter was alive. Megumi was alive. Shiguru took the train to the discreetly hidden location they told him about. But on the ride there, his hope switched to anxiety, realizing that even if she was alive, she may not be able to return home that easily. When Shiguru arrived at the members building, he was shown a magazine article from modern Korea. So we're going to read a quote from the article, in English, of course. Oh, good. (laughs) The article said, I am writing this article, hoping that someone will give me any information after reading it. This case is quite grim and cruel. The victim is a child. The facts were disclosed in late 1994 by one of the North Korean spies who exiled himself to South Korea. According to his account, The incident happened probably in 1976, one or two years before the couples were abducted, one after another, from shores of Japan. A 13-year-old girl was abducted from a Japanese shore to North Korea. The ex-spy did not know where the shore was. The girl was on her way home after her badminton lesson in school. The North Korean abductors, who were about to escape from the shore, were witnessed by the girl. So they caught her and took her back to their country. The girl was smart and studied hard because she was told that they would take her back to her mother's place when she mastered the Korean language. And I just want to cut in here so we don't gloss over that. They told her that if she mastered the Korean language, she could go home. So they were manipulating her desire to go back to her family. When she turned around 18, she realized that she would not be able to go back home, and she became mentally ill. When she was hospitalized, the ex-spy learned about her case. The girl was said to be a sister of a twin. This is all I know about the girl's abduction. So this was written by a reporter in Osaka um, for Asahi Broadcasting named Kenji Ishidaka. He got the story from a high-ranking official for a South Korean intelligence agency who heard the story from a spy who had exiled himself from North Korea. So this is kind of a long game of telephone here, but the information lines up too well to be ignored. Hmm. They said she was abducted on the way home from badminton and that she was a sister of twins, I mean, her twin brothers. Um, so, obviously... This had something to do with Megumi. It turns out that no one who passed the story down had any idea it was linked to Megumi Yukoda. The connection was actually made by a high-ranking police officer for the Niigata police who had attended a public talk by the director of Modern Korea's Research Institute, Katsumi Sato. And within a year, the information reached Hayamoto 
who had specifically had been looking for these fishy cases with possible connections to North Korea. So basically, according to this, the North Korean government had sent spies that kidnapped children from the shores of Japan, and Megumi was one of them. And she had been taken to Pyongyang, North Korea. Saki got home from her group that day around 6 p.m. She noticed that Shigeru seemed to want to say something, but he just sat on the couch contemplating what he'd say. He finally spoke to her and said, Today, something strange happened. <laughs> she asked him, Is it about Megumi by any chance? So an interesting detail is that during her prayer group that very day, each member of the group took turns praying to find out where Megumi was. Could be a total coincidence, but either way, it's pretty interesting. Shiguru was afraid to tell her the news because he wasn't sure if it was trustworthy and didn't want to get her hopes up for no reason. Yeah, remember, they had been victims of pranks in the past. So to him, the story was almost too strange to believe. Because North Korea was so foreign to him, and he never suspected that that's what could have happened. But Saki was too excited by the news to let it go, and she felt hopeful again. Megumi's brother, Takuya, lived in Fukuoka. After hearing his sister could be in North Korea, he was consumed by a helpless feeling of being so close yet so far, because he felt as if he could see the Korean peninsula just over the horizon. Every time he looked at the sky, he thought of his sister. Megumi's other brother, Tetsuya, cried while he was on the phone with his mother after she gave him the news. He was actually embarrassed that he started crying, but accepted that it was natural as her brother. Yeah, don't be embarrassed. I mean, we all know that uncontrollable feeling you get sometimes when you just can't hold in the emotion anymore, right? Exactly. Soon after this, someone visited their home with more information. They told the family that shortly after Megumi turned 18, she learned that she would not be able to return to Japan despite mastering the Korean language. She begged them to bring her to Japan just to look at her family from afar. She promised she wouldn't talk to them and that it would be supervised. But they rejected her. <sighs> That's so... Like... So, like, cold hearted, they were trying to get um information out of her from about Japan, or like, why, why, yeah, well, we'll talk more about it later, but like, this is just so cruel, they wouldn't even let her. I mean, you can see how badly she just wanted to see her family again right. and know they were okay. Which, were they taking care of her there? Well, yeah, she was living there, she, and they were trying to learn from her. It's just odd, it's just such an odd. Thing. Well, that's yeah, exactly. It's such an unbelievable thing for a government to do, and it's in the 1980s. This isn't that long ago. After the government rejected her, Megumi fell into a deep depression, realizing that she'd worked all that time for nothing. And hearing this completely broke Saki and Shigeru's hearts. And later on, more information came from someone who apparently went to school with Megumi in North Korea. Hmm. One of her abductors was actually an instructor there. He had been overheard saying that he took Megumi that night because he thought she was in her 20s and didn't realize that she was a child. Huh. He said that when they took her on the boat, she fought and resisted so hard that they threw her into a closet on the ship. She kept crying out for her mother, but was ignored. She scratched the walls of the closet through the whole trip and she was so persistent that when she finally came out of that room, her nails were bloody and falling off. Ugh. So awful. And remember, it was also storming that night, so the waters were probably pretty rough. And she was locked in that room for 40 hours. Oh, gosh. A completely miserable trip. So when Megumi's parents heard about what really happened to, her do to their daughter, rather than break down in despair... Megumi's mother, Saki, was absolutely furious. About a month after they heard these details, they made arrangements to meet up with the former spy, who this account had come from. His name was Mr. An. It's interesting, they had this image in their minds of this terrifying, scary, hardened old man. 
of Mr. Anne, but they were shocked when he actually turned out to be a polite young man. They showed him a picture of Megumi that was taken when she went to the airport to see her grandfather off, and he confirmed that she was the girl he was thinking of. After speaking to him, they were convinced that this account was truthful. In fact, they actually started to feel like Mr. An was a victim himself of the North Korean regime. Remember, he had exiled himself from the country after working as a spy, a pretty high-level job, so if he, ranking so highly, felt the need to escape, it must have been pretty awful for him, too, and really shows how empathetic uh, Megumi's parents are. Right? That they felt pity for him, too. Yes, agreed. As Saki and Shiguru parted ways with Mr. An, they actually wished him well, and Saki told him that she would pray for the safety of his family, who was still in North Korea. Mr. An was extremely emotional himself, and the kind words of Saki made him start sobbing. This is probably the kindest words he'd ever received in his life, you know, from someone that wasn't his family. So, with this interaction... We see on a human level how the actions of these leaders, these government officials in control, making these stupid plans to steal people from other countries, how these decisions affect individuals and families, just regular citizens. And they seem to view citizens of other countries, or even their own citizens, as their pawns for whatever, whatever they want, you mm -hmm. know? Several family members of abductees, including the family of Kiko Arimoto, Kenji Ishidaka, Masami Abe, and Tatsukichi Hayamoto, along with three other couples, united to form a group. And Kiko Arimoto was another woman who was kidnapped by the North Korean government, and we refer to her in our latest Patreon episode that's coming out side by side with this one, where we talk about... Um, Something that's related to this, which we'll say later, but we'll probably do a deep dive into Kiko's story in the future, too. The group reached out to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and other politicians, trying to get help to find their loved ones. But they got a cold response and no action. The families were filled with feelings of despair and helplessness, just as they had for so many years. Around the same time, Megumi Yokota's story was being reported on often because of the new developments, which got more public attention on cases of abduction. So Megumi's parents joined them, and March 25th, 1997 is the day the Abductee Family Association was founded. That day, 12 people representing seven different families got together at a hotel in Tokyo. So this group included Megumi's parents along with several other family members of other people who had gone missing, and we were going to try to say all their names, but uh, we don't want to disrespect them by butchering the pronunciation so much, because we actually tried to say all their names, but it sounded terrible. <laughs> mm -hmm. So if you want to know who they are, uh, go look up the Abductee Family Association of Japan, and you should be able to find those details. But... I mean, you can see how many people these abductions affected and right. how many families. Mm -hmm. Saki had actually read articles about some of these other people who went missing just a few years after Megumi had disappeared, and she felt they related to her daughter's case. But when she brought that newspaper to the Niigata police to point it out, they told her their cases were too different from Megumi's. Yeah, so what? But now, with the new information from the spy, it seemed a lot more likely that she was right all along. The day after this meeting, they reached out to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and the National Police Agency, showing them photos of their family members trying to appeal to their humanity. They begged for their help to bring their loved ones home. It had to be pretty moving, you'd think. Oh, you'd hope so. Shiguru acted as the group rep representative and read them a statement saying, quote, Our sons and daughters suddenly disappeared, and there have been no clues about these cases. However, recently ex-spies who had exiled themselves from North Korea gave accounts that they had seen some of those victims, which are beams of hope in the dark for the families left behind. 
We really feel we want any help we can get. The government should promptly make efforts to reveal the truth about these cases. They should collect information through the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, send officers to South Korea, and confirm the cases with the help of the South Korean government. Based on those efforts, we want the government to demand the return of the victims from North Korea with a resolute hand stand. We do not oppose the food aid to North Korea, but speaking from the humanitarian standpoint, we frankly think that our sons and daughters must come back first. Since our sons and daughters have disappeared, it has already been more than 15 years. The precious time that had been lost during those years cannot be compensated forever. Yeah, as if Shigeru wasn't going through enough at this time, his own father passed away that same day at oh the age gosh. of 93. Oh. And it had been his passion, because this was Megumi's grandfather, it had been his passion to get this group formed to work toward the return of his granddaughter. And they actually felt as if he had held on just long enough to see that group form. Hmm. The photo that they showed to Mr. Ann before this was from the last day he'd seen his granddaughter. It became their final goodbye. Eventually, the Abductee Family Association heard back from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. They were told to come to the Akura official building, where they waited in a room on the first floor for a long time. Eventually, someone came and called the Yokota family upstairs. The four of them walked into a room and sat down with the Vice Minister of Foreign Affairs. But when he spoke to them, it was in a cold and assertive tone. He said, quote, I'm really sorry about this, but your daughter has been dead. What? After all of this? Yeah, another huge blow to the family. The family was shocked and devastated. I mean, after getting their hopes up that she was alive after all this time, they're just flat out told she's dead. And they said it was just in a really matter-of-fact and cold tone. They told him they didn't believe him and asked when she died. The minister just replied saying, I don't know actually. So we really didn't seem to care that much about the family's feelings. They were told that Megumi had been married and had a child, but didn't have any real evidence to confirm it. Later, Shiguru spoke to the reporters as a representative of the group and told them, quote, I was looking forward to, today, to today's results, but the result was a death. Then he lost the ability to speak and just coughed. And can you imagine having to speak as the representative of this group a after finding out this? No, it, that would be devastating. The next day, they were told they'd be meeting a man who actually met Megumi's daughter. This man said that a 15-year-old girl named Kim Hai Kiing showed him a badminton racket and cover that was supposedly the same racket Megumi was carrying the night she was taken. She also showed him a picture of her mother, Megumi, when she was 20. Yeah, unfortunately the man didn't have any proof of the items, or take any photos or anything. So Megumi's family was shocked by this information and didn't know how they could really believe it was true. Right. The girl had also said that she was only in preschool when her mother died. Later, they heard from North Korean officials that Megumi had become severely depressed and was put in a, into a mental hospital. And then they were told something absolutely appalling. So, listener discretion is advised for this part because it's pretty awful to imagine. According to the North Korean officials... Megumi took her own life while she was in the mental hospital. They said that she hung herself. Saki could not believe that her daughter would do something like this and immediately assumed that it was a cruel joke from the North Korean government. Pyongyang actually sent them ashes and claimed they belonged to Megumi. The family had DNA tests conducted on the ashes and they weren't able to find a match. So... To the family, this told them that it wasn't her ashes and gave them hope that she was still alive, but 
The technician that tested the DNA actually spoke up about this and said he was new to the job and had very little samples to work with, and they were poor quality. So the DNA could have possibly matched if he had better samples. And Why are they using a brand new technician to do this? Well, I don't think they'd pick technicians based on profile. I don't know. But I can't. I didn't know they could test DNA from ashes. You would think everything would be destroyed yeah, that's during a good point. the cremation. So. Mm-hmm. The DNA of their supposed granddaughter was also tested. But those results came back as conclusive that Kim, Kim Hai King was absolutely Megumi's daughter. So, this is bittersweet, because the family really doesn't want to believe some of the things they're being told here, but now they're finding out that this girl who says her mom died when she was in preschool is really their granddaughter. Hmm. It had been 25 years since Megumi disappeared, and they had finally gotten their first piece of physical evidence about where she'd gone. Shiguru wanted to visit his newly discovered granddaughter, But as a representative of the Abductee Family Association, he was not supposed to visit North Korea for any reason, as North Korea was their main enemy. So he was obviously really conflicted because he really wanted to meet her and hear about Megumi's life, and he even hoped that they could bring her back to Japan with them. Yeah, I'd be like, screw you guys, I'm going to see my grandkid. I know, but again, there's a risk that they might not let him come home. Yeah. If he's actively campaigning against their government. True. <sighs> Saki and the boys were much more opposed to this idea. How could they ever get out of North Korea once they were in it? And, like I said, if you really think about it, these people are leading an organization against North Korea and an enemy to the country, so it definitely wouldn't be a good idea to go there. That makes sense now that I think about it. I forget about how... Strict North Korea is. Oh, yeah. Finally, in March of 2014, they were able to make arrangements to meet the girl. They traveled to Ulan Bator, Magnolia. Ma- Ma- Mongolia. <laughs> Mongolia. I know that. <laughs> From March 10th to the 14th. This was 11 years later, so she was 26. But Kim was now married, and her new name was Kim Un Gyeong. Plus, she had a 10-month-old baby. So, this was a pretty happy time for them to be able to meet their new granddaughter and great-granddaughter. Wow. They also learned more about Megumi's husband. His name was Kim Young-nam, another abductee, but taken from South Korea. They got married in Pyongyang as captives, which is, I mean, they could definitely relate to each other, both being taken from their home countries. I wish um, their story would be made into a book. It sounds like a really interesting story to focus on, their yeah, love story. Maybe someday. Um, but the information available about Megumi's life after she was abducted is very limited. I mean, North Korea doesn't let want to let much information out, you know? Mm-hmm. But there's one more question that we can still answer. Why was North Korea stealing citizens from Japan? Well, it turns out that they were taking people from other countries so they could learn about the cultures from these people. The abductees were used to train North Korean spies how to fit in with other countries. The demographic of the abductees was supposed to be early 20s, and the man who snatched Megumi thought she looked like she was in her 20s. So this is really sad. Technically, 13-year-old Megumi should have never been taken. I mean, nobody should be abducted from their home, but this makes it even more sad. It sounds like from that first document that um, her parents were shown that she was kind of in the wrong place at the wrong time and saw something that she shouldn't have. But it's so heartless and shows how certain high-ranking government officials view the value of human life. They just view lower-class citizens as their pawns that they can use for whatever they want. And they ruined countless lives over all this so they could train spies for those countries. Mm. You know? Mm -hmm. Between 1977 and 1983, at least 17 Japanese citizens are confirmed to have been taken by the North Korean spies. 
but this is only officially confirmed people. There are actually hundreds that are suspected to have disappeared because of this. And it wasn't just limited to Japan. Megumi's husband was abducted from South Korea. Other people were abducted from European countries. North Korean operatives would lie in wait and take advantage of any opportunity that they had to abduct a helpless citizen. And they weren't only abducted to train spies. Some older victims were taken just to kill and steal their identities. Wow. Just absolutely heartless. Others were taken to be wives of, to members of North Korean terrorist groups. And one of them was called Yodogo, or Yodogo, which targeted and terrorized Japan. And speaking of which, uh, we release, we're releasing our ninth premium episode on Patreon telling the story of the Yodogo group, um, Japanese Airlines Flight 351, and the Red Army, which is also closely related to this North Korea situation. So go check out our Patreon to listen to that. It's um, also very interesting. So that was pretty heavy. Hard to believe that a government of a country... In nineteen the nineteen seventies and eighties would do this. And you know? really hard to read. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> there were a lot of names. Um quite literally it was difficult to pronounce and say. We know we probably got the pronunciation wrong sometimes, but we mean no disrespect. Obviously we we're just trying to tell the story the best we can and yeah. <laughs> so We've gotten some new reviews today. Apparently, a radio station somewhere shouted out our podcast because we covered a case, but we have no idea what case it was. What news station it was. But we do know that the person who wrote the review wasn't happy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Apparently. But we thought it was pretty cool. Well, so that it I'll was just on, read it real quick. It was on a news station. It said, a news station in my area recommended this podcast because a story they did recently took place here. So I'm guessing it took place where the radio station was. And they go on to uh, say that it sounds monotone and... Fake. 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 <laughs> and... <laughs> It says, yes, it's a rough subject, but reading the stuff word for word from a script doesn't help. Have a little more personality or find a new subject. So anyway, (laughs) (laughs) we've made no secret of the fact that we do read from a script. I mean, a lot of big podcasts do. Last podcast on the left is actually kind of the format I have in mind when I put together the script. Because, you know, it's obvious they're reading from a script. Same with the dollop. I mean, there's a lot of podcasts that read from a script and then try to incorporate conversation into the script, and that's what we try to do. But I'm guessing whatever case this radio station recommended was an older one, because I'll admit that in our earlier episodes, we definitely had a hard time um, sounding natural. It's It was a growing process, but we're hoping we sound better now. Anyway, if you did find our podcast because of this radio station, let us know. Yeah, we're Because super we curious. have no idea what it was or where it came from. So we'd be very curious to know what case it was because mm-hmm. it's probably an older one. We're hoping it's not. <laughs> <laughs> not what? An older one. Well, I am. You are? Because they, did, they oh, the said it sounded bad. So Yeah, you're right. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> um yeah, enough about that. Just let us know if you know what station that was. <laughs> and we're going to share some nice reviews. Okay. So, um, I'll read this first one, mm-hmm. if that's cool with you. That's cool with me. All right, it says, deserves nothing less than five. Aw. Ryan and Rosie, I wanted to write this review and give you both five stars for a while now. I have been listening since your first initial podcast, and my loyalty grows listening to each new episode every, almost, week. You both are very respectful and considerate given the nature of the subject you discuss, without leaving it dry. I am one of those that love the fact you are married. I like hearing the jokes between you. It's cute. (laughs) Additionally, I like how respectful Ryan is of being a man. 
as many of the victims are female. That's really sweet. I should have had you read this. <laughs> um, he gave an example of being a male postal carrier and that position of trust, and I thought it was spot on. Keep on producing the podcast. I can't wait to listen next week. Heather Marie. Thank, Thank you, you, Heather Marie. We really appreciate that. And it was five stars, which um, means a lot. We appreciate those five-star reviews. We sure do. Our next one is entitled Great Love for This Podcast. Short but sweet and to the point. It says, I absolutely love this podcast. It is greatly needed, and I would listen 24-7 if I had more time. That's so sweet. From Bug Mom 16 Thank Aww. you. That was really nice. Thank you, Bug Mom. Um, we also got an email asking how, you, how to write a review. Ryan, would you like to expand on that question? Oh, yeah. If you would like to leave us a review, which we would really appreciate um, to help offset the negative reviews from whatever radio station <laughs> shouted out our crappy <laughs> episode, um, you could do that on Apple Podcasts. It's pretty easy to figure out. If you're not on Apple... Um, I think you can leave reviews on Stitcher. Chartable? Which is, no. No. That's not. Um, Never mind. I think Podbean also lets you leave reviews, so, yeah. Uh, that's all I can think of. But anyway, we would appreciate it. Very much. And if you don't feel like it, that's cool, too. We get it. So, anyway... Uh, <laughs> another thing we've heard is that we need to rehearse, but... Let me tell you right now, we don't got no time to rehearse. <laughs> exactly. You may have seen on our Instagram post, but I've worked 43 hours already this week. By Wednesday, I had already worked 43 hours. Um, Because it's Christmas season at the post office, and it's pretty crazy. So... Thank you to our really kind listeners for understanding that we don't have time to rehearse. We barely have time to write the script itself because we are two full-time working people that do this on the side because we love it. And, you know, if you if you don't like the scripted slash... Commentary. Yeah, whatever our approach is, that's fine. Everyone has their own taste. So thank you for giving us a try. And, yeah, I think that's about it. Yeah, I do, too. So we're going to wrap this up. Don't forget to check out our new Patreon episode uh, that ties in very much so with this episode. And I think that's about it. Mm -hmm. I'm excited for next week's. Me, too. Rosie wrote next week's episode, Such and it's very personal. Gem. Yes. <laughs> and it also, Kintsugi... That's a Japanese word, isn't it? Don't spoil it. So, uh, <laughs> you can follow us on Instagram at VOV Podcast. You can follow us on Twitter at VOV Pod. And you can get t shirts and mugs and tote bags and cool stuff like that at VOV Podcast.threadless.com with our logo on it and with Rosie's face <laughs> slash design on it. And I think that's about it. Mm hmm. Email us at VOV Podcast if you want to talk to us or recommend a case or whatever. We've really appreciated all the feedback. So, all right. Well, if you have anything else to say, Rosie, now's your chance. We've got to start on that Patreon. we got to be done. Yes. <laughs> we right. actually still need to record the Patreon episode, but it will be out um, side by side with this one. So, all right. Thank you for listening, and we will talk to you next week. Bye.